Welcome to the Daily Focus for July 5th. This is an extension of our teaching ministry at FBC. And today we're looking at Romans 9, starting in verse 6. Paul writes, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all those who descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the Spirit, Scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very perfect purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed on all the earth. So then he who has mercy, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills and hardens whomever he wills. Oh, how Romans 9 (laughs) will bring you to a place of confusion and questions. Let's begin, though, with an agreed-upon foundation. First, see that God cannot fail. That's where verse 6 begins. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. Namely, the foundational work given to Israel that were listed in in verses 4 and 5. Paul is saying that that was not a failure on God's part. Secondly, God is never unjust and can never be accused of being unjust. In verse 14, Paul asks the question, is there injustice on God's part? And he answers, by no means. So then, with just these first two truths, we can approach God and, and never can we say of him, you've made a mistake. God, you messed up. Or God, you invested in the wrong people. And God, you had to change your plans. That's nonsense. God does not fail. And we can never go to God and rightfully say that something that he has done is not fair. God is always just. It's a heavy point to make here at the beginning. But know that God would be just in sending all people to hell. That is just. That includes me. And it includes you. That, that would be a just response to what I have done. And that in order to maintain his justice, the only means to save you was to transfer your punishment to Jesus Christ. And it was paid in full. It was paid on behalf of you. And that his infinite and holy son stood in your place. This preserved God's justice. So then, as Paul speaks of Israel's rejection, he anchors himself to the truth and, and teaches from that truth, that God cannot fail and that he is always just. So in his question of why did Israel reject Jesus, the answer is clearly because God designed it to be so. And he doesn't have to give a reason. Yet God does not leave us in the dark completely on this. In terms of salvation, we see that his eternal purposes are are being fulfilled. God doesn't have to show us anything. We aren't in we are only entitled to judgment. And, and escaping, that would be enough. But for other things that we accept, like, for example, the acceleration from Earth's gravity, it's negative 9.81 meters per second squared. We know that, but we don't know why it's that. That's just how God designed it, and that's all, period. But in terms of salvation of Israel, when you read the gospel in the book of Acts, you will see that God doesn't say this is how it is, period. But you see that God's unfolding of salvation, God's unfolding of the Great Commission here, and you see um, his reasoning for Israel's rejection. First of all, Israel's, Israel's rejection served to crucify Jesus. John 2, specifically, we see that many believed in Jesus, but Jesus did not put his trust in them. Then in John 12, Jesus enters Jerusalem, and instead of soaking in their praise and dwelling there, he overturns tables and hides 
from them in the end of John 12. Secondly, Israel's rejection and persecution after the cross brought salvation to the Gentiles. This is the unfolding of the book of Acts as you skim through it, where the disciples begin in Jerusalem and then are sent out, not because they had a heart for the lost outside of Israel, but firstly, they they are sent out because they're being persecuted. Paul said that salvation to the Gentiles was a mystery of God. Not that in the sense that it was beyond their understanding, but it was beyond their prediction that God would work in that way and, and towards all people like that. And Peter seemed to struggle the most as he may have had, he may have been, even been the source of, of segregation between Jews and Gentiles in the church as he too acted differently depending on who he was around. So when Paul says that God's word will not fail and that God is never unjust, it is on full display that that the rejection from Israel brought about God's plan of redemption and brought much glory to God. And and from where things can get heated and and the point where I even at times get accused of being a, a bigoted Calvinist, even though I've never even studied Calvin, I couldn't tell you much about him. But too often, Christian arguments begin here. And so you ought to know what the Word of God says concerning those who are saved. Or, as Paul writes here, the elect. First of all, Jesus made it clear that salvation was for all who believe. The invitation of Christ was broader than anyone wanted or expected. It was John 3.16. It's the verse that you know quite well. It says, For God so loved the world. That's how it begins. And Jesus is telling this to Nicodemus a man that didn't love the world, but loved Israel. And he would take offense probably to their God or what they would claim is their God, the God of the Old Testament being so inclusive now to the world. Secondly, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you just flip one chapter over, that's Romans 10. It's the echo of invitations and altar calls of pastors around the world every Sunday. Yet it is clear, though, in this passage that God has the ultimate authority of those who will and those who will not come to him. Some may argue on the basis of free will, yet yet you need to know that your free will does not override God's will. And to remember that Romans chapter 3 verse 11 made it clear that no man will ever be content or will never seek after God. Romans 3.11 says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Do I understand this? No, (laughs) I don't. But salvation is the power of God for all who believe, not the power of Caleb. And it's not based on my understanding. And, And I can raise my mystery flag early and I can wave it all around this. But here's what I know. And here's what you ought to know too. First of all, know that men and women are responsible. That is a truth. Men and women are responsible before God. And secondly, know that God is sovereign. You can see these two truths beginning with the church in Acts chapter 2. Peter preached these words. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Do you see it there? Do you see both truths? They were responsible for their rejection and for their actions. And God... God's definite plan and foreknowledge was that they would reject. They were responsible and God is sovereign. Do these truths harmonize in in the minds of men and women? No, they don't. However, they are parallel axioms given by God and they do not need to intersect. So how do we respond to this? Here's three ways that I wrote down. Number one, if you're a follower of Christ, know that God did not choose you based on your merit. Paul gives the example of Jacob and Esau here. And you ought to know that Jacob was a dishonest thief. He was a spoiled, second-born mama's boy, yet God had a unique purpose for his life. If you are in Christ, 
then know that God will display his glory in your weakness. Yet what I see too often from those who hyper-focus on predestination and election is too often uh, arrogance and pride, as if God would choose them because they were impressive. And if, if that is you, get over yourself. You may be a big deal in this world, but compared to God, you are weak and pitiful. And the task of a Christian, even the weakest, most pathetic Christian, is always more than even the strongest and the smartest man would be capable of. And secondly, we share the gospel. Why? If, if God has already chosen the elect, why do we need to share the gospel? Well, because God told us to. That should be enough. And more than that, because the gospel is the means by which men and women are saved. And it is... It comes when men and women tell them about Jesus. And in doing so, you are participating in the glory of God. It is an honor and a privilege to share the good news of God. And we saw even in this passage, Paul shared the gospel because he was burdened for the lost. And that's where Paul began. Uh, He would have traded himself for Israel if if, if they would come to Christ. And lastly, thirdly, you may be asking, how do I know if I'm somebody that God has designed for his mercy? Here's what I know. If you are seeking God, that is not a natural tendency. Again, Romans 11, no one does this from their own will. No one seeks after God. Listen to what Jesus says from John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. In verse 37, though, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So then, if you have a hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you are seeking after God and asking the question, does God choose me? Does God desire that I would be saved? Based on my understanding of Scripture, if you are seeking after God, I think that's pretty clear that God is calling you to himself. So then, repent. Repent and believe. If you're seeking after God, then draw, God is drawing you to himself. Repent and be saved. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father God, to be honest, I dread having to talk and to, to teach from Romans chapter 9. I think that your word is clear, Father, but What's unclear, Father, I think oftentimes is our own pride on either side of it. The pride that would come from some that would say that I, am, I, I sought after God because I was so smart or so intelligent or because it was so obvious to me. That's prideful, Father. No one seeks after you. Or the pride on the other hand, Father, that's, that comes from those who, who would say, God chose me because of, I'm, I'm something special. That's pride on the other hand. And, and God, you, you would not be minimized in either way. Salvation belongs to you, Father God. So for our misunderstanding of this, Father, forgive us. God, I pray for those today that are seeking and hungering for righteousness. Father, I do know that you save and you are drawing people to yourself. So my prayer is, Father, that they would come to you now so that they can enjoy the fullness of your goodness and grace beginning right now. That they would repent and believe and have faith, (laughs) faith on Christ, that Christ will save them. God, I thank you for your goodness. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.